Welcome you all for today's webinar. I hope you, you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. From Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm again here with you today, uh, Kamala Gunwadana, fellow representative of the ISL Council for this year also. Sharing this knowledge, sharing subcommittee of civil engineering structural committee. So actually as one of the highway consultants for many years in this construction industry, I'm a I'm little bit uh, happy and I'm honored to join this webinar series and to give away this uh, instigating speech. So before I start this today's program, I request you all to mute your microphones always, because we have given you an uh, opportunity to unmute by yourself, because we found once uh, it was a bit difficult when we un permanently unmute you and it was not working properly. So please uh, respect that facility and you unmute mute yourself uh, always. When you want to speak, please unmute. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, today also I will uh, brief uh, you what our schedules from civil engineering section of company in a very briefly. Uh, basically, we organize uh, technical programs on every Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, Tuesdays are exclusively for this uh, medium rise building designs and construction lectures. And we have started that one in last December. So we have done about now seven lectures we have completed. Wednesdays are planned to arrange non-technical presentations and our main objective of that presentations are to give the, uh, organize the member development programs and some public awareness programs. We, we thought that we sh as a civil engineers, we should do some uh, service for the society as well. So. Thursdays are again like this for multidisciplinary technical presentations, and we have done with four programs up to now. So that's a quick briefing of what we have done so far from our civil engineering exceptional committee. About the today's webinar, uh, this, is a, this is a continuation that we have planned to conduct series of webinars of different major areas of express phase and highways. Uh, that is, of course, uh, design and construction board. Now we are going with this uh, design. This, uh, we started with the design last week, and today also we are doing this uh, design of box structures in express and, and highways in conjunction with your accord. So this is the second webinar we are doing today. Now I will introduce the resource person today. Uh, his Again, engineer Yasela Sumar Singha, who was the consulting structural bridge engineer for Central Expressway, section two. He's having about more than 17 years experience of uh, stru in structural designs and has worked in infrastructure projects funded by ADB, World Bank, and JICA, so on. Uh, he graduated from University of Morocco in 2004. He obtained his master's from Griffith University, Brisbane also an OSEN scholar and received academic excellence for his master studies in Griffith, Australia. Uh, he has several memberships in several professional uh, institutions, uh, Institution of Civil Engineers UK, Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka and Society of Structural Engineers also. He's serving as a panel member for the professional review examinations conducted by IESL. Uh, of course, his expertise is directly associated with the design of structures in expresses and highways, including major structures such as viaducts, bridges, overpasses, and underpasses, superstructures with pre stress concrete girders, including continuous girders, box girders, steel concrete composite superstructures, steel truss bridges, and many. <laughs> yeah, so that's a quite uh, expensive explanation about our resource person today. Before I hand over to the present presenter, I appreciate the guidance given by our Professor Jaising, who is the chairperson of chairman of the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee, and uh, 
uh, tremendous effort done by the uh, subcommittee chairman, uh, our Manjula Samasinghe, engineer. And uh, actually, in, all the leaders of the subcommittees and the members who has taken keen interest to do this progressive work. So I want to remind them at this time. So you are, yeah, we will we will start today's event right now. And there will be a, <clears throat> I would like to remind you, there will be a continuation of a series of webinars for expressways and highways in coming uh, Thursdays also. Without further ado, I will call Engineer Sales Humanism to take over. So please enjoy this evening with this webinar and hope you will grab whatever the most important areas he delivers today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Engineer Mrs. Kamala Gunwardana. And thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction of me. And uh, I have Welcome. to thank uh, uh, our audience who has come to spend uh, with us in this beautiful evening. And thank you very much for the Civil Engineering Section Committee, uh, chaired by uh, Professor Jai Singer, Professor MTR Jai Singer, and the Organization Committee to invite me to uh, conduct this session. So today's uh, today's our subject is uh, design of box structures uh, in highways and expressways. Uh, uh, in uh, to the code of practice, uh, which is the state of the art uh, code of practice of Eurocode. Uh, so I'll uh, uh, start with the, some introduction part to the, what is mean by box structures in what we call. So uh, in box structures in road, if we say, say box structures, there are box culverts and underpasses. So uh, box culvert, uh, what we call, why we call box culvert, it uh, facilitates the uh, drain, the drain of the water. Uh, so when it comes to underpasses, uh, it facilitates to uh, underneath uh, traffic loading. So we call underpasses on those stuff. Uh, so box, cul box structures are very economical structures when, uh, when it's uh, supported by, uh, Someone has uh, so my case not muted by it. Yeah, now it's all right. Uh, so box culverts are very economical structures when it, the allowable bearing capacities are very less, and uh, also when there are high 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 uh, high level of embankment, and uh, you have a very small water path. Then again, box culvert comes as a very economical structural solution to uh, conquer these uh, obstacles. So you see uh, pictures of box culvert. Uh, the first, this, uh, if you can see my cursor, this is the single cell box culvert. If you see this, this uh, culvert is a multi-cell box culvert, probably it seems to be four openings. And uh, there, there, there are culverts uh, in situ casted and uh, precast casted. So if you see, this is a precast box culvert. Uh, there are uh, these segments are uh, laterally as well as there are two parts in vertical and bottom uh, and uh, these are connected by with shear keys uh, to enhance the shear uh, resistance. So uh, now this is my personal experience. This is from Mankulan to Mulatiu Road. This is uh, lies in the near to Mulatiu. And uh, now this place uh, is was initially uh, to done a bridge structure with a pile foundation due to the very uh, bad subsoil uh, conditions. But uh, we managed to, since this is a very uh, small water path uh, connecting the nearby lagoon, uh, we under understood there is no any uh, major uh, water flow so that we could have given a much more economical solution of tree cell box culvert. And you can see uh, this is the construction photos of the box culvert, and you can see there's a haunch, and these are the construction of walls. Now, again, uh, this picture shows uh, precast box culverts units and uh, some uh, 
segments are there you can see uh, in in the in the uh, culvert segments there are male and female ends so that uh, it connects well and uh, uh, have a clear uh, shear co connection between that uh, these two uh, these segments and uh, if we need to in, in enhance the uh, uh, this uh, uh, prevent the differential settlement between these two uh, uh, these segments we can introduce a tie bar tying all these segments as well so in the first picture you see a segment casting not only on the lateral direction but also vertical and uh, vertical direction as well so this is a very big culvert and so that it has uh, uh, done with the two segments uh, uh, of uh, precast sections. Now I will briefly introduce the component of a box culvert, culvert uh, box structure. So the top slab, which we call uh, generally it's a top slab and uh, uh, the, the walls retaining the earth, earth side, we call exterior walls. And whatever the uh, in the, uh, walls other than the external walls, we call those are interior walls. So these four, uh, these four walls, if you follow my cursor, uh, these, uh, these four walls, we call wing walls. The, the, what, what is the reason behind the providing wing walls is to protect the uh, nearby approach roads embankment and it creates the soil uh, obstruction soil uh, fall into the uh, water flow and also it prevent the embankment from the uh, covering or uh, hydrological flow damages as well. So between these two wing walls, we find the apron wall, apron uh, we call apron slab. So why we provide a apron wall? That is also against to prevent the scouring effects. Uh, scouring effects. Now, this is uh, in the inlet or outlet, both we provide the apron slab. Uh, in even in the uh, uh, outlet, if the, there are certain hydrological flow, flow types where uh, out, uh, outlet flow velocity is high, in that cases there will be a scouring at the outlet. We call there as a scouring hole. With the scouring hole, there will be underneath cover of the foundation so that uh, stability of the box culvert will be compromised. So that we provide the apron slab. Again, uh, you can see uh, behind the ap uh, down downside of the apron wall, there is a shear key. Actually, there is a shear uh, uh, facilitated shear, but this is again for mainly uh, we call this cutoff fall. Again, this is for prevent the scour. Generally, uh, we uh, calculate the scour depth based on the flow flow velocities, and uh, based uh, generally we provide 1.5 times covering depth for uh, apron, apron uh, slab and uh, as well as the shear uh, cutoff fall. So box culverts can be found in roadways, railways or irrigation systems. And uh, uh, there are a wide range of box culverts. Uh, there are mainly uh, major division is rigid and flexible types. Uh, rigid types, uh, when it comes to concrete uh, box colors or box structures, we call it rigid structures. But uh, there are some certain type of structures uh, constructed with steel, and uh, these uh, these are stabilized with the uh, earth steel uh, interaction. Uh, so these are called flexible uh, type of structure. Today's our lecture based on rigid types of box color or box structures. And uh, as I said earlier, my pictures shown you, uh, there are uh, cast in situ and pre-cast segmental construction, which is widely used in uh, all over the world. Now, when it comes to the design, uh, the box structures, generally the uh, road structures in Sri Lanka is uh, designs of these structures are carried out based on the BS5400. Uh, so, uh, uh, along with BS5400, uh, we have a highway manual which is published by the Road Development Authority. Uh, we call it the design manual. And uh, this is, these are the two uh, major uh, uh, practice code of practices for us in Sri Lanka. Uh, but the uh, problem is these are going to obsolete. And uh, when it comes to BS5400, uh, there are two versions of that one. First published BS5400, uh, first published in 
78. This is there are uh, 10 parts in BS5400. So part two is the relevant code for highway traffic uh, and the loading uh, in the BS code. So the part two, there are uh, two versions. First, it published in 1978. Then later, it was uh, uh, revised in, in the 2006. So the, uh, in, in, in our roles, both these versions are in, still in use. Uh, uh, if, I, if you can remember my last lecture, the Expressway CP2 was constructed to BS5400 part two, 2006 version. So uh, now the problem here is the, the Euro code. Why, what is the significance of our lecture today is this BS5400 is uh, there, uh, the, there are no any updates on BS5400 in future. It is obsolete code. Uh, code of practice. So now the UK and the European Union uh, countries have moved to Eurocode. Now it is uh, BS5400 part two is superseded with BSEN BSE 1991. Uh, uh, we call it Eurocode one. Now uh, Eurocode is a state of the art code of practice and it has incorporated latest uh, research founding and the design techniques. And uh, the main point is this Eurocode is uh, adopted by several uh, European countries so that it this code of practice allow local variations. I mean, it is it can adapt it country to country, region to region, whatever the uh, environmental condition, loading condition, uh, whatever the thing, uh, there are so many, there are so many variations in the region. In, so socially, economically, and even in the uh, environmentally. So for all these conditions, Eurocode is a very flexible code, uh, which can be adapted for a country. So uh, other than this one, Eurocode provide a platform to the designers to work in area uh, universally. I mean, uh, now, if you, if you, uh, um, not in like a BS code where, uh, the even a German or uh, Fr France would be not practiced in previous BS code, but still when it comes to Euro code, it's, it's, it's a, uh, you can work anywhere in the Europe and you have more opportunities. You can work or either you can take the job from there. So Euro code comes as a family. So uh, Euro code 1990, BSE in 1990 gives the, uh, the first, uh, it's a general description of the uh, uh, ULS and SLS design criteria and the uh, factor of safety is to be adapted. So uh, Eurocode 1, uh, it, is, it is about loading. Now in BES, we call loads, but in, in Eurocode, uh, one difference is we are not no more loads, it is all actions. So Eurocode 1 gives the actions on the structures. So uh, BES, Eurocode 1 itself is a uh, consists of a several documents. Uh, which I explain you later, uh, but right now, other than uh, Eurocode, one has a several uh, sub booklets. Uh, and uh, when it comes to Eurocode 2, it is all about concrete design. And Eurocode 3 is about steel design. And Eurocode 4 is about composite steel, uh, concrete composite design. And Eurocode 5 is about timber. And Eurocode 6 is masonry, and Euro, Eurocode 9 is aluminium structure designs. And uh, Eurocode 7 is a, about uh, uh, geotechnical design. Now, if you can remember our BS8004, which uh, deals about foundation, uh, BS8004 is uh, superseded by the Eurocode 7 uh, version. And Eurocode 8 is about seismic designs. So uh, this is another slide of explaining the same uh, Eurocode family. Uh, now, this slide uh, tells about the EC1. As I said earlier, now this Eurocode 1 consists of several documents. Now, these slides give the, uh, uh, what are those sub-documents? So Eurocode 1, uh, 1 is uh, Eurocode 1991 part 1, 1. Uh, this, this is about low loading actions on building, and it has superseded the BS6399 part one. 
Now, uh, one, two is about uh, load erupted from the fire actions, and one, three is about snow, snow loading, and one, four is about wind loading. And both, uh, if you uh, familiar with 6399, uh, this one, three and one, four superseded. Uh, 6399 is superseded by 13 and 14 and 11. And uh, when it comes to 15, it is about thermal loading. Thermal loading means mean temperature and different temperature. And if, we, uh, if you are familiar with BS5400 part two, uh, which uh, uh, discuss about uh, temperature effects on bridge, uh, bridge superstructure, uh, uh, that part has been superseded with BS uh, 1991 15. And uh, 17 is about, sorry, 16 is about uh, various load when the, uh, during the structure execution. And 17 is about accidental load, accidental loads. And uh, now all these are 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And this one is 1991 part two, uh, 1991 two. This is about traffic loading. That is our major uh, discussion is about today. Now this has superseded BS54001 and BS54002. So all the bridge, uh, uh, if, you, if you are have engaged with structure design since highways or expressways, you have very much, you should have very familiar with this 5400. And this has superseded by 1991 part two. And uh, uh, this part three, part three is about uh, loadings, what you get from the crane, crane, uh, crane and gantry gant cranes. And four is about silos and tanks. So as I said, uh, Eurocode is a very flexible code and uh, how you how they have adapted how they have maintained this uh, flexibility is uh, through the nationally de determined parameters so eurocode gives a certain certain parameters for a, a, each load cases so the load cases or the design uh, techniques there are some parameters you can uh, define it in nationally based on their social, economical, uh, I mean, economical and environmental conditions or loadings. So uh, what, whoever, uh, what, whatever the country who adopt the Eurocode uh, need to define these uh, NDPs and how they define the NDPs through the national annexes. Uh, so to use a Eurocode in a country, we need national annexes. So uh, now this slides gives a uh, uh, how, how how some uh, some uh, figures on national annexes. So the first two gives the national annexes to uh, BS 1991-2. and if you see that we our st uh, standard in uh, SLS I mean standard Sri Lanka standard institution is the authority. Authorizing body to publish our national annexes. So now they have uh, someone has unmuted this mic. I would say. Uh, let me check. Someone has unmuted this mic. Okay, uh, so uh, Sri Lankan standard institution also has published national annexes to Eurocode, and especially very recently they have published the uh, national annexes to highway traffic loading as well. Uh, to, uh, so uh, most of the time these are uh, go hand in hand with our US national annex annexes. Uh, so, okay, now I will go to the uh, uh, load. Uh, what are the loads applicable in uh, for the box culvert slide by slide? So, the basically the earth load uh, comes to the uh, box box structures, and there are two parts of loads from the earth. It is from vertical or either lateral. So, uh, uh, vertical loads we call from earth surcharge, and uh, lateral loads are called earth 
lateral earth pressures. So when it comes to lateral earth pressures, the earth pressure coefficient is very important factor. So there are uh, uh, four lateral uh, earth combination uh, earth pressure coefficient. Uh, most of you know uh, th there are three three factors. I mean, Ka the active active earth pressure is uh, active earth pressure and passive earth pressure and at rest conditions. So. Uh, if there are no any data on the uh, our soil so, so, soil uh, addition soil, uh, we can uh, generally use uh, active earth pressure coefficient as 0.33 and uh, passive earth pressure coefficient as three. And when it's at rest, when the your walls are very rigid and no deflections, uh, the K naught at rest conditions applies. So that is K naught is six. So there are several load uh, combinations where you need to minimize your earth pressures to get the critical actions. In that case, we can use K, mini K minimum as a 0.2. So these are uh, based on uh, different different guidelines. These are, so this is a uh, you can it's a designer's choice what to do. Uh, but there are several guidelines uh, with a clear guidelines how to uh, adapt these figures. Uh, now, now, in this picture, you see lateral, how this lateral earth pressure uh, applies to the box, color, box, box structure. Now, with, with, the, with this lateral loading, uh, the wall, wall gets sagging and the, your top slab is getting hogging. So if you see with the earth pressure, your mid-span sagging moment get less. So that's why uh, there are several load cases where uh, to get the maximum span moment at the top slab, we need to minimize the K minimum. So in that cases, we use 0.2. Uh, so uh, I, I talked about lateral earth pressures. Now I go to the vertical earth pressures, which is called earth surcharge. Now this is very important with a very high embankment exists. Uh, now these are uh, you find in expressway. You in normal highways these are rarely uh, not uh, not finding uh, very widely. But uh, when it comes to expressway, you will find a uh, box cut structures with high embankment. And in uh, even in irrigation structures, you, ca you can find this one uh, with the high uh, fill uh, conduit sections. So that uh, you need to con uh, consider this earth sur surcharge. So uh, now, uh, now if you see uh, now uh, this soil part, you can see my uh, pen. Am I right? Can someone raise your voice, please? You can see my pen. pen am I right? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yes. You can thank, see. You, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, now uh, this is a this is a this is a soil path surrounding soil path like this, and uh, this is a earth surcharge. This is what this 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 soil uh, create this earth soil surcharge. But thing is, when there is a settlement of adjacent soil path, what is happening here? What is happening here now? If if this soils start to move downside, settle, uh, what will happen? There will be a upward uh, friction here due to the new according to Newton's third law for this soil mass. There will be a uh, friction uh, force like this here. So from both sides, there will be an additional vertical load for this soil mass. So even though you have a, let's say 10 meter surcharge, uh, you can't directly take it as a, a density of the soil into 10, let's say 20 into 10 is 200, but uh, actual, uh, actual effect is more than that. We, the, the engineer Marston has studied this one and there are some, so there are several guidelines what to, uh, effective, uh, effective, effective. Uh, someone has unmuted this mic. Can you please take your mic? 
thank you okay uh, so this 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 will create additional uh, earth pressure uh, earth surcharge so this is a dmrb guideline what to do in these kind of cases you have to multiply this uh, whatever the surcharge uh, by a factor called beta so there are two graphs here so uh, the if you find this beta the factor is less for this uh, bottom graph and uh, factor is high for top graph so bottom graph is for when, when uh, top graph top top line is when your box colors uh, sits on a let's say in a rock hard rock but still your adjacent soil is uh, soil is uh, settling then the, this uh, effect is very high in that case you have to use this first graph so up to 8 uh, cover, 8 meter cover depth you have to, you, you can increase your soil uh, surcharge by 1.5 later you have to adapt uh, uh, adjust your beta factor based on this uh, uh, equation and uh, uh, when when your box culvert rests on a normal 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 ground, so the, the, if there, there is a possibility to both sides to be both soil mass uh, all these soil masses to settle each other. So the, then your there is a friction forces are less, so your beta coefficient is less. I hope under, you understood this principle. So uh, when it comes to the uh, adjacent soils uh, other than the soil surcharge there are adjacent soil masses and uh, from the nearby wall uh, you, you have to place your construction surcharge uh, the major thing in uh, euro cold is you have to uh, distribute this uh, soil for, letter, uh, for downward in the 30 degrees angle Then, uh, then uh, we talk about earth pressures. Then we have to talk about pore water pressures as well. So, when the pore water, groundwater is uh, groundwater level is high, we have to account the groundwater pressures also. So, effective stress with the effective stress analysis, you have to uh, you need to account one minus k times gamma w. Uh, Uh, now this is earth pressure so this is one minus this length is uh, one minus k into the uh, so this is here so you have to uh, get the area of this triangle and count the water pressures for the our uh, box structures uh, now now if you see now one minus k is k is around for for active uh, coefficient is 0.3, uh, so 0.7 into 10 is uh, uh, 7. So you see now uh, when groundwater pressure is uh, applicable, your your normal earth charge, so lateral earth pressures will be double. So that is the general uh, general uh, figures. Uh, if you are you have to account the pore water pressure, uh, your uh, lateral earth pressures get double that's why during the rain season uh, most of our now in the dry season your return involved stands well but uh, when the rain starts if the your you have not applied uh, sufficient weep poles or uh, not account the uh, gr ground water pressures your retaining wall get failed during the rain season uh, now in the box for box structures uh, we can uh, uh, for the box structures, uh, if we need, we have we can uh, reduce these pore water pressures by providing a filter material uh, uh, like this. And uh, uh, we we can provide the filter material like this. And uh, we can provide a geotextile to prevent the small uh, particles come uh, come and obstruct obstruct the uh, filter material. Uh, 
uh, and putting a perforated tube here, and we can drain out the all the pore water pressures and relieve the pour, uh, get the relief from the pore water pressures. This is uh, what we do in most of the highway structures. Uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, uh, irrigational uh, large conduit structures, we are, you will have to put it, uh, these type of structures for kilometers underneath. Uh, this is not practical. So in those cases, you have to account uh, the pore water pressures into your designs. Or even in a express phase or highways, uh, you may need to consider all this stuff for the enhanced uh, enhance safety. Uh, then, then we have to uh, count the temperature loads. Uh, now, if the, your structure is buried very deep in the soil, these temperature effects are not uh, uh, effective, uh, much high, uh, negligible. But your, if your culvert is near to the surface, near to the road surface, let's say uh, 0.6 meters, uh, cover is less than 0.6 meters, then these temperature effects may uh, have to be accounted. So there are two types of mean uh, temperature we have to account. Uh, one is mean temperature and the other one is differential, tem differential temperature. So mean temperature is about uh, uh, how this uh, surrounding temperature, ambient temperature uh, varies and uh, now, uh, there are several guidelines on how to uh, count these uh, temperature loading. So uh, again, I'm referring to a DMRB guidelines. Uh, this gives a uh, uh, T maximum is a, uh, I would say 15 year recurrence uh, return period of but highest, highest temperature in the 15 year recurrence period. Uh, so according to that, you have to account the uh, overall temperature increase or decrease. But if you see, this is applicable to all for all um, uh, component of the box culvert, culvert so that the effects are very minimal. When the uh, mean, mean temperature effects for the culvert is very minimal. So uh, it, it is not a very critical issue. Uh, but if you, if you, if you uh, come to uh, uh, differential temperature, which is temperature variant according to the in the surface top slab, uh, that may be critical. Uh, if you especially if your uh, culvert is near to the uh, road surface. So uh, several guidelines are there. If you can remember, this is the, if you are familiar with BS five four double zero. This is the temperature gradient they have given uh, and. Uh, uh, this is the DMRB guideline, and this is the new Eurocode 1991 uh, 5. Now, if you if you can remember my earlier slide, uh, I will go to this one again. This one, this one, 1995 15. This is about thermal loading. So, in this code, it gives the thermal uh, variation, uh, differential temperature variations to which we have to adapt in, uh, consider in the box culverts. So uh, now, now this is a graphical expression of how these uh, temp differential temperature effects. So with the positive, uh, positive uh, temperature gradient, the, uh, the deflection is hogging. The thing is here, you get a sagging moment. Now, generally, you are expecting this is a hogging moment, that's, but these are, these are either internal stresses, the deflection, deflection oriented uh, structural effects. So, uh, so it will give a sagging moment at middle. And uh, here is a uh, slab is sag, but the effect is a uh, hogging moment here, negative moment here at the mid span. And uh, other than other than the temperature effects, you need to consider uh, shrinkage tracks. This is uh, addressed in the uh, design stage, not in the analysis stage. Uh, so uh, you have to provide the uh, now. The, if these these box colors are very long, I would say less than uh, uh, ten meters. Uh, higher length is more than ten meters. Let's say seven eight. That, that, that which is very long and there's no joint is provided 
especially you have to think about the early thermal shrinkage cracks and uh, uh, you can account this stuff in your reinforcement design and uh, in, a, in a box structure there are there are several type of restraint conditions uh, the first one start at the four slab uh, clasping into the binding then wall beam so slab, your screed is screed holding your slab uh, not allowing to shrink so that there will be a shrinkage cracks then uh, your wall is cast to the floor slab then your roof slab cast into the wall on those equations uh, the each part is restraining the other part uh, not allowing to shrink rate, uh, shrink uh, so that there will be a cracking so uh, you have to consider this stuff in your designs now in a box structure uh, there are several load cases to consider uh, now you see there are several various ways of uh, now sometimes based on your uh, based on your lateral earth coefficient you can uh, your earth pressures get large or uh, minimum in the, the, the this has to be accommodated uh, i will go to next slide then you can have more understand what i'm saying here so the first one we have to consider is maximum horizontal load and maximum vertical loading in that case we have to consider the uh, highest traffic loading with the highest uh, Factor of say, uh, load factors, and you have to maximize your uh, uh, lateral earth pressures. Uh, and uh, you have to put your surcharge, uh, whatever the vehicle surcharge, construction surcharge, also. Uh, so, this part gives the lateral earth pressure, and this part is giving the uh, earth surcharge, uh, sorry, vehicle, vehicle or construction surcharge part. So, this in this case, we have to put maximum vertical maximum horizontal the next slide uh, it is about minimum vertical and maximum horizontal on on the, on on this in this side of scenario so your wall is deflected like that and you get the tension here so if you want to design the tension reinforcement here you have to go this kind of uh, load arrangement then uh, you have to other other type is maximum vertical load and uh, you have to out uh, your lateral earth pressures are minimum okay in the here what will happen is now in here earth pressure is there and if the water flow condition is here so this is somewhat uh, compromising each other so this deflection of this wall is minimum but due to the maximum uh, vertical load your uh, slab get bent like this so so if you want to get the maximum uh, span moment here you have to go uh, find the load condition like this and you get the maximum hogging here as well but your uh, uh, wall bending moments are very less again uh, then they are, we have to consider traction plus minimum vertical loading. Uh, what, is the, what do you mean by traction? It is about braking and acceleration loads of vehicles. So these kind of deflection uh, uh, of the box color is like that, so that very high corner moments are given. So if you want to find the hoggy moment, these are the type of uh, load conditions you have to adapt. And uh, for the buoyancy effect, now we have to secure uh, uh, structure for stability. For the buoyancy case, you need to uh, consider uh, these type of with minimum traffic loading. The load fa fa load factors you are using has to be minimized, and uh, then you have to consider your buoyancy effects. So now I have uh, discussed about the uh, earth pressures, uh, temperature loads, and uh, how they interact with each other in the, these load cases. Now, in all these slides, there were traffic loads uh, marked, but I didn't uh, explain you earlier. Now I will move to the traffic loads. Now, uh, 
in earlier the, these traffic loads uh, uh, in the BS five four double zero we do did have uh, HA and HB loading uh, to uh, simulate the road traffic, uh, but in Eurocode uh, we do have a different set of uh, uh, traffic models to accommodate it. So there are we call load model one, load model two, load model three, load model four. Uh, so those are the uh, generally we call LM1, LM2, LM3, LM4. I will explain what, what these are mean. And uh, in the horizontal forces, uh, as a horizontal forces, we have to account braking break, break and acceleration for uh, one thing. And there are centrifugal and transverse loading as well. So all these loadings will be grouped into GR1A, GR1B, G, group 2, group 3, group 4, group 5. Uh, so I will explain all this in, in these following slides. So uh, what is about load model 1? Uh, load model 1 represents the general traffic in the road. I mean, normal, uh, normal uh, lorry, general lorry loads you will found in the main road. This is somewhat very similar to the HA loading in the BS5400. It's always simulating the general traffic. And load model 2 is a single axle loading, and uh, there is no any similar loading uh, in BS5400. And uh, load model 3 is for a special vehicle. Special vehicle means once in a lifetime of a structure, this kind of load will happen, uh, very rarely occurring. Let's say you are uh, you are you are you are moving a generator now in in a in a race in, in near future there will be a tunnel boring machine transporting from Trinco to uh, uh, Habaran. So in that case, those type of high loadings, uh, very, which very rarely uh, we are uh, moving in a bridge in its lifetime uh, will be accounted in load model. Three and load model five is crowd loading, so this is very much similar to pedestrian loading in BS5400. Now, in Eurocode, I said uh, these are Eurocode is very flexible code to adapt in country wise. So, to accommodate this one, Eurocode have a national development para, uh, determined parameters. So, in load model one and two, there are in there are we call uh, NDPs are there, which we call alpha and beta. For load model one, there is alpha, and uh, load model two, there is a beta. So default values is one. Uh, so your uh, wide national annexes, these factors can be changed with the proper research and uh, proper justification. You can't go ad hoc uh, because there are minimum values are given, uh, but nevertheless, uh, this has to be uh, done with a proper research based on the country specific economical and uh, 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 present traffic situation. Uh, so again, uh, when I uh, when I explain in the Eurocode uh, traffic loading, first you have to uh, identify the carriageway width. Generally, carriageway width is uh, the with you with you uh, with you find between curb to curb it, let's say race curb race curb to race curb uh, uh, left hand race curb to right hand left curb that is the uh, width that available uh, now if you see this is this is what simulating the the space available for the road traffic so there are some definition. Uh, generally, you can see it's a width between curb to curb. Then it comes to carriageway notional lanes. So what do you mean by notional lanes? So if you are familiar with the traffic loading, I need not to explain this one, but still I will explain this for the other many other audiences. Now uh, in the roadway, road road in the roads, there are lanes are marked. Uh, let's say. Uh, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a normal road, there are uh, two lanes are marked, but, but in a traffic situation, you will see several lines of traffic are made. Uh, the, 
don't think that this is happening even in Sri Lanka, but uh, in other ways, other countries also, this is will happen if there is a traffic traffic situation, high congested traffic. So that we have to account those kind of uh, uh, traffic loading. So that so what so that what we do, even though we have marked two lanes in a road uh, road roadway. What we see, we take the curb to curb lane and see how many vehicles you can uh, put in the uh, put within these two curves. So that's how these notional lanes are defined. So not uh, not like in uh, BS five four double zero notional lanes here comes as a uh, integer and uh, width of the notional lane is almost three three meters for each and every case unless so very uh, uh, very limited case where carriage your carriage base is 5.4 to 6 for all other cases your notional lane with goes as 3 and uh, what you do is you will divide your carriage way carriage way with this with this width by a, a 3 and you will get the number of notional lanes so now if there's a remaining part that will uh, define as a remaining area so so this is a plan view of a uh, road and you will see uh, uh, lane number one lane number two lane number three and whatever the remaining part less than three meters it is uh, we define as remaining area now 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 i go to the load model one mm -hmm. Load model one, uh, as I said, it is uh, it is uh, just replicating the general traffic in road. Uh, so, it, uh, can you check your mic, please? Someone has unmuted. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so load model one consists of uh, simulating the general traffic in the roads. So we have uh, uh, two Excel loading and UDL loadings. Can you please check your mic please? Someone has unmuted. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, load model one is uh, simulating the general traffic in the road roadway. So, uh, all this uh, load model one is consist of uh, Excel loading and the UDL loading. So, Excel loading comes as a two Excels. So, we call this tandem system. In the Eurocode, we call this tandem system. So, for the lane one, there are two Excel loading. Each Excel is 300 kilonewtons. And uh, for this lane one, UDL is uh, nine kilometers, kilonewtons per meter square. And for the lane number two, uh, your Excel load is 200. So both these Excel have 200 and your UDL is 2.5. And the third lane, uh, you have another two set of Excels and each Excel is 100 kilonewtons and your UDL is 2.5. And the remaining area, so rest of the any other lanes, will there are no tandem loads, but you will have a uh, UDL load of 2.5. So this simulating the general traffic in the uh, road in Eurocode. So again, uh, Eurocode give a very clear uh, description of these load models and all these, uh, uh, Excels are spaced in 1.2 meters, and the two tires of this one two single Excel is placed on two meters. And uh, so uh, each tire, tire area, I mean the load area is 0.4 times 0.4 area. So uh, these are these are very important, especially if you see in the design you will get very high bending moment. In that cases, you need to disperse these loads to get the uh, optimized optimum uh, values. Otherwise, you may 
find very difficult to design the certain structures with Eurocode due to the high loadings. Now, uh, as I said, uh, LM1 include the national development parameters, uh, which we call alpha. Uh, Uh, so, uh, all uh, this, uh, the, this, uh, you can, this Q, 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 uh, UDL can be multiplied with alpha. So, if, if normally the alpha is a uh, come to one in the default in the euro code, but from the national annexes, you can uh, reduce this one. So, uh, if you see, these are the default values. In this case, lane one, lane two, lane three, we are talking about, and the BSC in 91 default values are one. So in the UK national annex, what they have done is, uh, they have reduced the uh, first lane loading and they have increased the second uh, so, uh, uh, they have increased the second UDA. Now, uh, this is based on the, uh, uh, the reason behind this one is Eurocode uh, is uh, harmonizes the BS uh, 5400-2006 version. So, for, so that they have, uh, now what will happen is uh, nine, Nine kilometers into 0 0.611 comes to 5.505. 5 5. And if you multiply 2.5 into 2.2, it comes to 5.5. 5.5. So all these three lanes have a same, same set of UDA. So that uh, it will be easy to uh, calculate your bending moments or shear forces uh, because your UDLs are uh, same in all lanes. So that is the rationale behind UK National Annex. Uh, but in, originally, these uh, three layers have different types of uh, UDAs. So uh, I would omit this part. This is uh, my research founding. I don't want to discuss that one here. Uh, so when it comes to the horizontal loading due to the braking and acceleration force, uh, LM1 specify this formula. So it is, uh, it can be, it can be simplified to 2.7 into span into 360. This is somewhat very similar to uh, figures are different, 1.8 span to, to 200 in BS5400. So uh, this is what uh, about uh, traction loading in Eurocode. So when, when you applic, apply the load, load model one to the bridges, uh, as I said, your lane number one. Now we have to define a lanes in, lanes in, uh, in the structure, but this doesn't, lane one not, from, start, not start from the edges. It doesn't, like, it doesn't work like that. But here, lane one is the most critical point. Now, if you see in this bridge, uh, in this bridge cross section, uh, lane number one is at the middle, because why? This is the most critical, uh, most critical location uh, where the most severe effect will be given. So, where that occurs, we have to decide where this lane, lane one number one is, uh, lane number one is situated. So, like that, you have to accommodate uh, lane number two in the second most severe location. Lane number three is uh, third most severe location. That's how uh, we have to locate. We, uh, generally, we can uh, identify where to put this one. Otherwise, if you're not sure, you have to go with the influence lines to determine this stuff. So, we, then we go to load model two. So, that is consist of a single axle. So there is no any similar load cases in HA, uh, sorry, BS5400. And uh, this is consist of a single uh, axle of 400 kilonewton. And uh, uh, here the tire area is 0 0.6, 0 0.35, not like 0 0.44 in LM1. 
Uh, why this load model 2 is introduced? This is because to identify the critical load uh, structural effects for smaller span, shorter spans. So if you design your box call load to the box, uh, in Eurocode, you're especially for one by one, two by two, three by three, that kind of spans, uh, the load model 2 give the most critical uh, structural effects. And again, there will be a, there is an NDP uh, for load model 2 that is called beta and uh, BS9 uh, uh, Eurocode, Eurocode gives a default value 1 and the UK national law also keeps, keep the same as 1. And uh, I said earlier also load model 3, we move into load model 3 and load model 3 is to simulate uh, simulate the uh, abnormal vehicle in the uh, which road structure has to face uh, in its uh, design lifetime. So there are several types of uh, LM load model uh, load model types. Uh, total weights around to six hundred kilonewtons to three thousand six kilonewtons. So. Uh, this is this is simulating to HB vehicle in the BS five four double zero. Let me click uh, Someone has unmuted his mic. Can you please check your mics and uh, mute that part? Thank you. Uh, then again, uh, uh, this uh, load model three may have uh, two tires now there are several axles if you see 600 kilonewton vehicle have four axles and it has a 150 uh, axle loads and uh, now if you see 2400 it's have 12 axles of 200 or 10 axle lines of 240 so uh, uh, if you see Mm. Uh, now this four axle line has a 150 kilonewtons. In that case, this kind of uh, tire arrangement is applicable. That is only two two tires. If you go to 240 uh, axle line, uh, then three tires are there, and you have to place your place your HB vehicle. Now this is lane one, lane two, lane three uh, for smaller type A type type A axles. You have to accommodate like this in a single carriageway. Uh, it's a three tire axle. You have to accommodate in a two, two, uh, one and two notional lanes. So uh, and other than the LM three, uh, you need to uh, combine the LM1 and L, sorry, LM2, sorry, LM1 loading with the LM3 also. So, this is the graphical representation, how to do that one. So, your abnormal vehicle is there. If your span is very large, after 25 meters, you have to put your uh, LM2 also, LM, LM1 loading, Excel loading also. Like that, you have to combine your. Uh, abnormal vehicle so uh, now th these can be uh, these can be uh, uh, these are flexible we can uh, change this one uh, now our national annexes uh, so this is the lm3 uh, sorry now these are the euro code uh, guideline for the lm3 so in uk national annex they have not gone to this uh, specification. They have given a separate type of special vehicles. First, they start with SV80, uh, and uh, it has six axles of 130 kilonewtons. And they ha then we do, they have SV100 vehicle. Then uh, that is six axle vehicle with 165 uh, axle loading each. And uh, SV196 is uh, how many axles? Okay, you can count it and say it to me. And uh, each axle has uh, 165, 180, and 100 axle loading. 
So which is to be adapted, that is to be decided by the highway, relevant highway authorities. And uh, in Sri Lankan case, I think we need more research basis what to adapt in our conditions. Uh, up to now in H VS practice, we are using HB30 with 4 XL amounting to 1,200 kN, total load of 1,200 kilonewtons. But here, uh, in that case, our HB vehicle is 1,002, but it was 4 XLs, but here it is 8 XLs. So, so I think there is a uh, more study need to adapt uh, to harmonize with our conditions. Features to be uh, more research to be done. So if someone, uh, if, if, if someone who requires research basis, this is a clear research area which you can uh, think of uh, to find the best suitable HP, sorry, load model three in Sri Lankan conditions. So as I said, load model four is crowd loading and uh, uh, crowd loading, and uh, it is almost similar to uh, similar to uh, BS five four double zero pedestrian loading. It's five kilometers from the square. And uh, now in Eurocode, this uh, combination of actions, combinations of loads are uh, something uh, uh, little complex. Uh, to understand the rationale behind this one, uh, you have to understand uh, the what what is this? Uh, what do you mean by characteristic value? So, characteristic value is a, uh, about I think thousand year return period maximum high, highest traffic loading. Uh, so, characteristic value, uh, that is the characteristic value. Now, normally, now in Eurocode, now what, what, what happened here, in the, if, you, if you combine the characteristic value of traffic and characteristic uh, value of the thermal and characteristic value of the uh, uh, pedestrian and all those have one load combination, that will never happen. I mean, it's a, not. I can't say never happen. It is a very rare chance of probability of happening, uh, and you will you can't find the economical structure design on if you consider characteristic of all these load combinations. So that what we do, we combine all these characteristic loading. Let's say highway traffic, the, uh, dead loads, pedestrian loading, and wind and temperature, all those stuff, we combine, combine the uh, characteristic value, then we reduce certain, certain variable loads by the combination factor. So combination factor is, combination value is lesser than the characteristic value. Okay. Then like that, now uh, in the combination, there is a, now, uh, permanent loading and variable loading. So or in the Eurocode, we have to account all the variable load in, in a one combination, but still you don't have to consider all the characteristic loading, but uh, in the uh, for the leading variable, you have to consider the characteristic loading. For the other variable loads, you have to reduce those values with your combination value. This is the rationale behind this one. So after, after getting this combination value, then you let up provide a factor of safety, gamma f, and uh, get the design, this, uh, design action. Uh, so if you're a little confusing with this stuff, uh, just keep these two figures in your mind. It will help you to understand the load combination in Eurocode. Uh, now, uh, for the traffic loading, just only for the traffic loading, 
you can't directly adapt HA LM1, LM2, LM3. Uh, earlier in VS5400, we directly use HA, HB uh, like that. But here in Eurocode, you can't do that one. Uh, you need to consider group, uh, tri traffic grouping, group 1A, group 1B, group 2, and like that, so on and so forth. So in the group one, you have to consider the characteristic load of, uh, of LM1, and you have to combine it with the combination value, this combination value of the pedestrian load. And for the uh, 1B, LM2 characteristic value there, no any other has to be combined. And the group two, uh, horizontal loads are taken into account in that case, vertical loads are not characteristic value it's a frequent value and uh, this has to be now the main case is characteristic uh, horizontal load so that uh, your characteristic value has been accounted group 3 is about uh, uh, foot, uh, uh, pedestrian and cycle traffic so that is uh, characteristic value uh, sorry, that is for uh, foot tracks. Uh, and uh, group four is about uh, crowd loading, and that is characteristic value. And group five is about special vehicle. Uh, there is no other vehicle to be combined, but if your national annex is uh, pro provided, you have to combine with the uh, LM1, as I explained earlier. So this is another illustration of load groups. Uh, first one, group one, you have to cut the LM1 and LM, group 1B is about LM2. Uh, group two is about uh, horizontal loads. Group three is about uh, loads on footway and cycle tracks. And group four is about uh, crowd loading. You have to imagine your total bridges uh, filled with your crowds like that. And group five is about a special vehicle. Uh, once in a once in a lifetime load in a bridge structure. So as I said, uh, uh, now if your your tandem loads can be distributed uh, 45 degrees angle up to the neutral axis of a slab. So keep remember in this 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 scenario, uh, if you get a very high bending moment, think of distributing your tandem loads in this way and get the structural action so that you can uh, optimize your uh, structural designs. Then I will move into the finite element modeling uh, box, box culvert. So uh, normally our software has used numerical methods to uh, analysis and uh, most widely used numerical method is finite element. Uh, in finite elements, what we do is we divide our uh, total structure into small part and connection uh, between these uh, elements are by the uh, uh, between the, these nodes. Uh, so in a uh, your finite element can be done in a two D framework. 3D, uh, 3D model. In a 2D model, your uh, structure is uh, simulating with uh, beam, beam elements. And uh, in a 3D frame, your uh, structure is simulating by your plate elements. So in a 3D, uh, 2D frame analysis, analysis, you can get the structural effects, but uh, still the lateral uh, distribution load distribution is not accounted so that uh, you may get uh, higher structural actions. But uh, in these cases, uh, if you consider 3D model, uh, all these lateral load distribution also accounted so that you get the uh, most optimal design figures. Now, in a 3D model, uh, uh, you 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 need to consider your mesh density. Uh, so, if you know the uh, actual real bending moments so the your bigger structural effects uh, you can see that you can decide what is the mesh density you need but uh, that is not the case in most most time most most of the time 
So you have to uh, do a sensitivity analysis to decide the uh, mesh density. So in this case, uh, these are figures are not arranged in uh, uh, correct uh, thing. But if you see, uh, now this is the same box colored structure. Now this is a this is divided to 1.5 times. Uh, so there are three elements in there. So in the one point, each element size is 1.5. So the next element is uh, one meter, one meter. So uh, the element is divided five. And the next one is this one is 0. 0.5. Element size is 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5 meters. And the next structure is 0. 0.25. And other one is 0. 0.125. So what I have done is here, I have applied a thousand kilonewton loading here at the middle and see the uh, critical span moment and uh, put it in a graph. And if you see, this is uh, uh, after 0.5, 0.5, uh, 5, 5, 5.5 mesh, uh, the results get converging so that uh, 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 much finer measures doesn't improve the situation. So uh, in this case, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is the uh, mesh size, mesh density you need to adapt. So this kind of sensitivity analysis can be accommodated to decide uh, uh, deciding the finite element mesh sizes. Uh, uh, now, what happens if you are not, uh, not not doing a correct mesh sizing, you will not get the most critical bending moments for your design and uh, you may find with problems. In your finite element modeling, then you have to consider your boundary conditions. Uh, generally, box culverts are uh, rest on the ground. So there is a concrete uh, soil, soil concrete interaction is there. So in a, uh, in, in your finite element modeling, you have to adapt uh, soil uh, elastic links to simulate the soil concrete soil interaction. In that case, soil subgrade modulus is the most important factor. This is comes on the um, geotechnical parameter. This is a geotechnical parameter based on the your soil subgrade modulus. You have to define your uh, elastic link uh, modulus. Uh, again, uh, after all these stuff, stuff uh, you have to co consider the construction stage analysis. Generally, uh, uh, check. So now if you box structure is like this, and your embankment filling height is like this, uh, so in the construction stage, you have to consider up to here. Earth is filled up to here, and your all vehicle, your vehicle surcharge is here. Construction vehicle surcharge is here, and you have to see the structural effects and the stability of the structure. Then you have to take an intermediate level and see what are the forces and the final level. So these are the general construction stages to be analyzed in the box color box structure in a highway. So. Uh, in Eurocode, I said that all the loading has to be accounted in a one go in a combination, but uh, not, not all the characteristic loading, characteristic plus combination loads. Uh, but uh, you, there is an annex A2 of BSEAN 90, uh, that, that's an application for BGS normative. And uh, it gives some exceptions. What it says, uh, snow and wind load need not to consider uh, combined with horizontal load as braking uh, and uh, uh, vertical loads, foot and cycle traffic loading, uh, and vertical loads of crowd loading. Uh, in addition, load group 1B is not required to combine with other variable loads which are not occurring owing to traffic. So 1B stand as a single uh, load cases. Uh, lastly, wind action and thermal actions are not required to combine and not considered simultaneously. So at once, wind and thermal actions are not needed. So this is the same concept in VS5400. So in the 
combination three you uh, the BS five four double zero combination three is about thermal and four is about wind. So similar type of adaptation has been done in Eurocode as well. So in uh, Eurocode, ULS conditions are there. There are three conditions: persistence and transitions conditions, accidental conditions, seismic combination, and in the serviceability state, characteristic combination is there. This is for the uh, kind of checking stressors. We are, uh, there is no irre reversible thing, but uh, uh, reversible thing like deflections and all those are which comes with normal position, frequent combinations has to be considered. The quasi-permanent combinations are for the crack fit, uh, so very long-term long -term effect like three. So if you are checking the crack fit, quasi-permanent combination has to be checked, uh, combination has to be checked, and uh, uh, for the stressors, characteristic combination has to be checked. So based on these guidelines, uh, uh, these are the uh, types of, uh, these are the uh, sample load combinations which are applicable to uh, box culvert, box structures in a roadway. Uh, and these are the uh, serviceability state uh, load actions uh, to be ad adapted. And uh, after that, uh, you can start your modeling. And uh, this is a type of uh, 3D model for the box culvert. Uh, for simplicity, there's no any wing walls. And uh, your uh, boundary conditions are defined with uh, links. Then your earth pressures are being applied. Then your uh, moving loads are applied. Now, this is a uh, this gives the LM2 most critical loading, and uh, this gives the uh, LM1 more critical loading. You can see uh, uh, UDL and the Excel loadings are there. And uh, so after analyzing this stuff, you will get your structural effects. And uh, based on your stru structural effects, you have to uh, do the structural design uh, based on EC2. So I will not continue for the EC2. Uh, I think uh, in a, another part we can, it's, more, it's a more kind of uh, academic thing. I mean, you will learn this stuff in your uh, university courses and all those stuff. Uh, what I have uh, described here is the general practice in our design practice in a, in a commercial environment. So, uh, you have to do your structural designs based on the EC2 design guideline uh, given by the Eurocode. So once the, once these structural effects have been done, you can check your uh, check all this stuff for uh, bending moments, uh, flexural effects, shear, and uh, uh, serviceable state stresses, uh, and crack pit. Uh, and as I said earlier, early thermal shrinkage cracking also play a part here. So you have to design all those stuff into this one. With this slide, I will conclude my lecture. Uh, I will, uh, I think, several. Uh, Few questions in the chat box, uh, in the, uh, Chat box, yeah. And uh, if you allow me, Mrs. Kamala Gunadana, I uh, I had a good question last time about my last uh, about my last presentation. Uh, what we have done in the concreting in uh, express state. Uh, mm -hmm. So allow me to uh, describe that uh, answer that question. Uh, yeah. In that case. Uh, I will, I have to uh, I will, I will, I will share my uh, uh, screen on uh, what do you call
so i will go to my past presentation uh, i hope you can see my presentation uh, what the question was about deck concreting what we have done in deck concreting um, so i have made additional few slide for that question also uh, so So this is the slide I'm talking about. You can see my uh, sli uh, slide, am I right, Ms. Ms. Kamala? Yeah. Okay, so this is the deck concrete. We used uh, deck, paver, deck pavers. And uh, you see now uh, for the, uh, in the bridge structures, you will get a camber. Your girders will be camber. Uh, due to the pre-stress and the uh, creep effects, uh, there will be a camber. Uh, with the time, this camber uh, uh, varied. So once you place place the gird, your girders in the, the uh, abutments or piers, uh, there will be a camber. And with the loading, it will uh, uh, your camber will be reduced. Uh, uh, now, if there will be a sagging in the bridge, there will be issue. But uh, during the concreting, if you see now, we have to maintain. Now, this is a okay. I'll, I'll play this video. So this is the this is what happened. Uh, if, if there is a sagging, this kind of sagging in the bridge at the service stage, there will be water stagnation and with the high speed, so many accidents may be happen. So we have to make sure that uh, with the loading, uh, there will be no permanent sagging. Uh, and this has to be uh, checked clearly. And uh, uh, what happened uh, with the camber, uh, now you have to put a minimum concrete thickness as a slab, and uh, so minimum thickness comes at the, this but, uh, middle part. And for the when it comes to the end part, your concrete thickness will be high. So uh, in the design stage, you will uh, uh, you you will you have to check this one the maximum concrete uh, thicknesses. Uh, so. Uh, in the, even the during the construction also we have to uh, yes. check the deck, deck deck levels and we have mapped the deck levels and uh, now if you see now in the design stage we expect the girder to be casted the girder to be launches after 30 days and after 6 days we expect to uh, uh, deck to be placed but in real world real situation those are not happening uh, uh, so there will be certain delays with the certain delays and there will be uh, canvas decreasing or increasing and uh, uh, construction sequence sometimes may get changed and the, uh, 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 the cement types and the con uh, there are several variations so that the temperature effects will be different so so there are so many deviations in the actual design scenario so that to accommodate those stuff, we have uh, take the deck levels and mapped and understood where these uh, uh, thicknesses vary. And uh, so in the, in the, in the, in, in, so this is the site monitoring of concrete levels, deck levels. So after placing the girders, we take the levels. And uh, after now, after placing the girder, then before the, just before the, the concrete will again take the levels and see what are the differences, whether sufficient thickness is available for the concreting. So if it is not there, uh, now we have to come with the solution, so solutions. So these kind of things has happened in even our, our project also. So we have provided given the good solution also there. So uh, initially in, at the design stage, we have checked with our manual calculations then uh, we have verified those stuff with our finite element modelings and uh, and our actual uh, actual situation has been monitored so these are necessary uh, for deck concrete 
So I think I under answered that question, which I got early this morning in our uh, sectional committee. Uh, uh, group in uh, WhatsApp. So, uh, at completion of a, could you elaborate use of water stop at joints of box culvert and underpass? So, mm, if you uh, now. Now, in an irrigation structure, if you have your, your, your transferring water in a conduit structure, definitely you need to put a water stop. Otherwise, you will lose your water and uh, not, not uh, it is a problem. Uh, in the box culvert structure, uh, now you have to provide the joints. Otherwise, you will have, you will uh, get a uh, uh, shrinkage cracks but still this can be accommodated in the design stage also but that is a uh, we have to think, uh, see with the length of the box structure uh, and you don't have to necessarily put a water stop in a uh, culvert uh, box culvert but for under underpass yes i would say because you can't expect groundwater falling in the head of your while you are passing going underpass uh, so this is a this is a decision you may take uh, during uh, considering the situation the conditions is there a record of abnormal special vehicle plant equipment loads that have tra traversed in yes and uh, there are there are certain uh, records. I mean, uh, RDA is checking when when this type of loading is uh, moving in uh, uh, RDA roads. Uh, RDA design redesign division get informed, and they have to check uh, for a record purpose. I know that uh, for the, during the Kuklaganga project, uh, turbine uh, our uh, small larger lo loads were uh, transported. During that time, RDA design checked all the uh, bridges on that road path. Please send the YouTube link for as good time. Yes, I will. We can share it in the uh, our WhatsApp group for a box color perpendicular load. How much benefit in terms of load effect reduction and re resulting economies can be obtained to 3D model compared to 2D frame model, which is in the initial model and interview. Yeah, 2D is a very uh, 2D is, 2D models are very uh, easier to interpret. But the thing is, in Eurocode, is you will get different different load. Uh, in the, if you see load model one, uh, uh, unlike in BS five four double zero, your Excel loads are different. So uh, definitely, you have to if you go by two 2D model, uh, your Excel. Uh, I think I think you can see my screen. Uh, if you see now in the load lane number one, you have a 300 kilonewtons uh, tandem and nine kilonewtons UDL. So for a Eurocode stuff, this 2D analysis is very difficult, difficult, uh, uh, difficult, and it will give uh, not give the most economical results. Did you consider soil springs on the side walls as well? And did you consider compression on the soil and fully elastic spring? For side uh, for side walls, no, we, we are not. Uh, yeah, American codes, uh, Astro codes recommend soil springs to be considered. But, but the problem here is it's very difficult. You have to uh, uh, address, you have to define your soil spring at rest. And uh, this thing is that finite element model uh, analyze this as in a one load case. When it comes to combination, it's very difficult to if you introduce lateral so soil springs. It will create a huge 
uh, problems in your model, but still the uh, American courts are recommending this stuff. Uh, but here, no, we didn't uh, adopt soil spring for lateral loads. And uh, did you consider compression only soil spring for fully elastic springs? Uh, yeah, uh, compression, uh, uh, generally, uh, there is no load distribution so that uh, fully elastic springs also will serve you. But uh, if it's a very, in a rare case, not you will find it very, very, very real in box color situation. Uh, compression only soil spring has to be accommodated. Uh, but the thing here, if you adopted compression only spring, uh, at some point uh, you may get uh, lesser results when you combine the traffic loads. So that be careful when you are using soil compression only soil spring. Sometimes you will get a. Uh, 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 smaller values for your when 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 you are combining it with the load mod, uh, may, uh, traffic loads. Uh, are there any way IGLS quantify lateral boundary conditions of a box culvert using FEA? Yes, uh, there are ways that, that as I think already discussed. You have to uh, define your springs uh, uh, in in at rest conditions and. Uh, then apply the loadings, uh, then active passive conditions will be monitorized. I think that is beyond the scope of this lecture. This is a, a something about soil structure, uh, uh, soil structure interaction. Uh, I think uh, we will, uh, I will stop at this, that point on that question. Uh, very important. So, do we need to consider about skew angle while modeling stuff? Yes. Uh, generally, uh, general guideline is if your structure is less than uh, 20 degrees, less than 20 degrees of skew, you don't need to uh, consider the skew angle. But, but uh, if you more than 20, you have to uh, accommodate the skew angle in your model. Uh, what is minimum concrete gate recommended for box culvert is 30. Uh, and for irrigation structures, it's uh, I mean cylinder uh, cylinder strength twenty five thirty, and for the irrigation structures is thirty thirty seven. Where you would have to accommodate uh, water. Is there any major divisions when designing aqueduct? Yes, uh, you uh, aqueduct. Uh, uh, there is no earth pressures, so. You, all most of your loading comes from the hydraulic forces. Uh, so those, that is the thing. And uh, again, the boundary conditions will be differing because there is no soil. Uh, only the uh, structure is act as a, I would say, a span, it's a span in between two piers. Uh, so your boundary conditions also change. So those are the major differences. For LM3 loads, what would be the speed to consider for analysis? Code says normal speed and very slow. So, yeah, uh, uh, generally, these are very slowly, slowly moving. If, if my memory corrects, uh, speed, what they are talking about, 10, 10 to 20 meters second, very low speed. Uh, I, I can't remember, but if you see Annex A of Eurocode, uh, 1991, it's uh, it, it discuss about this one. Please check it. With. There are honches in the culverts, how to get effects of honches when modeling the finite element. The honch, now there are, open, uh, uh, there are opening up and closing up moments. So uh, to opening up moments, uh, we, sorry, closing up moments, we need to provide uh, uh, reinforcement angle bars. So, uh, I, I have not discussed that stuff in this lecture due to the time constraint, but if you go to BD, BD 30, 31, uh, this, uh, discuss more in detail. This is a DMRB uh, guideline. Thank you for the question. Are you considering the effect of soil arching that will lead to change of dead load above the color? No. Positive arching is not, but negative arching is there. Then you have to take it into out. 
uh, that is some if you uh, you have to study maston theories on this one so uh, positive arching is not recommended to account uh, have you consider the pd 16 part 1 traffic loading thank you so uh, yeah uh, that is the uh, high, uk highway highway guideline uh, guideline for you euro code uh, so generally i am not taking but uh, if, uh, if certain projects are specifying that one uh, pd669 you have to accommodate accommodate but you can get a good guidelines on those stuff similar to dbmrb guidelines thank you very much what is the software good for finite element model sap for other? there are so many softwares one so each software has in own good and bad so it's depend on uh, how you are familiar with the finite software and uh, how how good is uh, generally sap stratpro midas uh, uh, sap those are the softwares and bridge, uh, CSI bridge. Those are the general software you use in highways. It is necessary to use granular material around the culvert to provide better rain. Yeah, always try to put a granular method so that you uh, decrease your pore water pressures. With that, I think I have uh, answered those questions, uh, Engineer Kamala. Uh, I think we can wind yeah, up. This yeah, session. yeah, I think it's uh, time to wind up. Before I hand over to our engineer team, I think it's, uh, I need to say a few words because it's, uh, I think I have not been much unfair to you because I requested you within a week or so, and it was well formulated, well informative, and well presented, I would say. So thank you so much, Sail. I think our choosing our uh, topics also, I think I got uh, direct messages also. So even I wanted to mention this, I, our, I have to uh, really encourage with our people and our folks also in, to choose this uh, topic and the resource person. So we have done it correctly, I suppose. Uh, thank you so much, uh, engineer. Uh, can I call uh, engineer uh, Trima? Yeah, good evening, uh, madam. I'm Trima Aitana, uh, member of the engineering section subcommittee. And I would like to again uh, um, uh, give my, our word of thanks to Engineer Sailor. This is actually Engineer Sailor. I would say that he is a very good asset to Sri Lanka, actually, in the bid, uh, bridge construction, bridge design uh, industry, uh, bridge industry, and uh, the designing and he, um, the, his knowledge is very vast. And uh, I highly appreciate your knowledge. And again, we had a good, uh, very uh, well, very well organized and very informative. Uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Engineer Sailor, for your kind uh, I mean, the um, allocation of your time and also uh, uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Very, um, very good lecture. Well organized. Thank you very much again. And uh, so I would uh, give our uh, thanks to the organizing uh, committee as well as the ISL IT section for uh, hosting this event. And uh, finally, uh, so I would um, give our thanks to all the participants. It's a very good participation today also. Uh, so without you, I mean, we can't uh, make this uh, presentation or the event uh, success. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you uh, with the engineer again, uh, engineer Sailor and everybody. So um, having, uh, sharing your knowledge and also the getting, uh, so we had a big uh, resume, a very good, um, uh, informative knowledge. Thank you again, everybody. So have a very good evening and a very good night to all of you. Thank you very much. You we will meet much. once again. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have to, I have to thank ISL, uh, civil engineer sectional committee headed by Professor MTR Jaisinger and, uh, arranging this lecture, uh, Mrs. Engineer Kamala Gunwardana and giving a very good uh, uh, word of thanks, uh, Engineer Trima Vitana, my good friend, and uh, Engineer, Engineer Manjula Samarasinghe uh, arranging this opportunity. And I have to thank all of the participants uh, spending their lovely evening with us and uh, share our knowledge. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for participation and listening. And thank you very much for civil engineering 
section committee for organizing this one. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.